in the eyes of God, we are made right by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we are justified by grace through faith. But we are also sanctified, and that's why the Bible talks, us, talks about us being saved, in the process of being saved. And it's how we grow in our obedience to the King, and we do that through grace and effort. We are working out our salvation with fear and trembling because we know that it is God who is at work within us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So critical race theory might be a tool in our sanctification. It might help us actually to grow more righteous in our participation in the wider society and expressing the righteousness of God in our social interaction, in our civic life more faithfully. If it has something to offer, that is what it has to offer. Once again, we looked at the levels of, of racism. We already talked about that, so I'll keep moving on that. The Bible talks about um, law, and it refers to God's law, but the way God's law operated in, Jude in Judaism, it was a political system. In other words, the law of God was the civic law. And uh, the reformers talked about three uses of the law. They were referring to the law in the Bible, but they use that concept to even try to use the Bible to set up just legal systems in society. And what they saw was the law has three, at least these three functions. One function is that it restrains evil. So within society, you set up laws to restrain people from doing evil. This is what Romans chapter 13 is about. This is why we obey governing authorities is because God actually uses civic law to restrain evil. And God's law, learning God's law, restrains evil by, by kind of drawing attention to it in our conscience. It is designed as a mirror to show us our need for salvation. When we look at God's law in particular, and when God's law is reflected in what is uh, put into civic law, we get to see just how wicked we are. And this gives us uh, our need for salvation. So um, civic law can't make a person righteous, but it does if to the extent that it reflects biblical law, show, shine a mirror on our wickedness and show us our need for salvation. It is also this flashlight, a moral guide to believers. Once we become a believer, we use the Old Testament law to give us an insight into God's character about what God considers to be righteous. And that provides like a flashlight, a guide for us to live a more righteous life. We don't live under the law, we live under grace, but it still has a function in showing us the character of God. The reason I point this out is because within the law, there are systems of economy and there are systems of politics that we don't want to necessarily replicate exactly within our government, but we do want to look at what they teach us about the character of God. For example, within the Jewish legal system, you could not um, harvest your field all the way to the edges of the field. Though, though you might be the owner of that land, God was the ultimate owner and God said, you cannot harvest the edges of your field. That has to be available to the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner among you. And you could not harvest your field more than once because the, what was left over was for the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. Now that shows us God's love for the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. It shows us that God considers himself to be the ultimate owner of anything we might consider to be private property. And it also shows that it is appropriate for a government to actually impose the ability for the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner to glean a living from society. So this is an example of how you look at God's law and you can see guidance for how civic law can be set up in a way that is consistent with God's character. So Christians are interacting, not just at an interpersonal level, but at a social level, an economic level, and at a civic level um, with what righteousness looks like from what we learn from scripture. 